The first talk that I'm going to be talking about today translates in a little bit of the session that if you had an opportunity to come by yesterday um, is what I call MRI assisted radio surgery or MARS. And it's really a, a framework to help define the changes of brachytherapy that have existed over time um, and where the next level and next phase of brachytherapy would go. And the goal of this is to really articulate what we've been doing at MD Anderson to um, help of, uh, to improve the quality assurance so that our implants can be done um, consistently and with high quality all the time. And so that's why we've incorporated MRI into every step of the quality assurance process uh, from staging to simulation, to contouring, to treatment planning, to implant and to post implant assessment. And then of course, into surveillance if necessary with rising PSA. Uh, here's my disclosure. I think the biggest one to be aware of on the disclosure is C4 imaging. This is technology that was developed out of MD Anderson. Uh, I am the founder of the company. Um, I'm really the scientific advisory chair for that company now. And so that's the one, um, but nothing that I will discuss is a non FDA approved product. Um, and it, everything it is, is uh, as I mentioned, FDA approved within this course of this talk. So I want to highlight this. This is a publication that came out from the Jour International Journal of Brachytherapy. And I've been told that it's the first time that a image was allowed to be put onto the front of the cover. And what this represents is um, a Mars implant where you're able to visualize exactly what it is that you've done um, and you can't hide from the truth. So if you've done a good quality implant, it becomes obvious. If you haven't, that also becomes more obvious and you have the opportunity to take the patient back, optimize the implant and doing day zero dosimetry, it provides also the secondary opportunity to provide a positive feedback loop so you can improve the quality of your implant the next time. So this is the MRI-based uh, MARS post-implant assessment that is critical to the quality assurance process. And this really eliminates the uncertainty. And what I'm seeing and what we're seeing in our is the residents are looking for different ways to eliminate uncertainty and to feel more confident about the way they've delivered their care. And this is a, a framework to help ensure that patients get consistent quality implants every time, um, really to avoid what we saw happen at the VA back in at the University of Pennsylvania um, and to ensure that that never happens again. The workflow is fairly, fairly straightforward. You can see in the upper, this has been, uh, this in the upper left-hand corner, you've got a uh, dominant lesion that has been identified on MRI. Uh, the patient undergoes a, a simulation. It's a single three to five minute sequence. It's a 3D MR sequence. It can be done on any MR whether it's Siemens, Philips, or uh, GE. Um, and that sequence is then taken for uh, simulation. You can see uh, contouring is done. Here's the treatment planning. And here is um, what the treatment plan is designed to share. And what, what's nice about this um, is that you can see that we're minimizing heterogeneity we're not urethral sparing, but we're actually minimizing heterogeneity because the entire prostate actually gets treated. And then we evaluate the patient with post-implant assessment. Um, in here, you can see we've brought in technology that puts the functional spacer or a serious MRI marker between the radioactive seeds so we can more easily evaluate and localize exactly where the seed is under MRI to achieve accurate post-implant assessment. And the goal is that what we plan, we deliver. And this is the, really the LDR Mars workflow. And what I aim to show in the next few minutes is the automation process that we brought into this. One of the key elements, if when we do Mars, is that the patient has their legs down in the MRI, but when they're in the implant, their legs are in the dorsal, dorsal orthotomy position. So how do we account for that? And the way we do that is the software allows for the probe um, to then 
achieve an angulation of, we've, we've calculated that angle to be approximately seven degrees. And that seven degrees is because when you, the way that we did the, the, um, the experiments is we lifted the patient's legs from being down to the dorsal orthotomy position and monitored the change in the external urethral sphincter in the Y direction. What we found was at the bladder neck, there was no change in that distance. So essentially you have an angle, which is the uh, inverse of the opposite over adjacent, um, and the arc tangent became a seven degree angle. That then allows us to then place the angle, which is here along zero, and then shift to ultimately put the grid so that when you get in the operating room, it will reflect what the patient should look like had the patient been in the dorsal orthotomy position on the MRI. For MRI contouring, we've, uh, in my lab, we've been working with finding ways to make this more efficient. How can we utilize auto segmentation and AI to contour out and provide a consistent quality of contouring under MRI for, for our patients across the, uh, the board? Uh, Jeremiah Sanders was a uh, PhD student, and what we ended up creating was mechanisms of, con of contouring from a dosimetrist, physicist, we had radi radi um, radiologist, and we had radiation oncologist. And we built this model ultimately so that we could be able to create predictions and within those predictions, compare it amongst the different cohorts. And the beauty of this is it created wonderful models that allowed us to do the following. So after I do the simulation, I then send this patient over. Um, this, this is exactly what is, what is done. And these auto contouring occurs and it's a, it's a, um, it comes off of a, of, of, this is in the MEM treatment planning system. And we've been able to articulate and place this. And this is the exact amount of time that it occurs. And so now you've got the bladder, you've got the prostate in light blue here. You now have the external urethral sphincter, which I call the no fly zone. You've got the rectum and you have the seminal vesicles and that's all it took. And so now we have the model to do that and develop consistent quality contouring for every single patient. So now we've taken the variability and uncertainty out, out of contouring. Now we've also then moved toward MRI auto planning. And what we've done from this is based on work that we've also looked at where how do we, are, are we able to um, uh, utilize MRI um, and are we, and previously we were using an endorectal probe and that endorectal probe was causing deformation of the prostate. So we moved to a non um, endorectal probe methodology and make it consistent and flatten out that prostate. And we then went ahead and, and put plans in and now we have up to a thousand plans and we're able to identify through our plan library and once we identify through the plan library, it identifies the volume. It then characterizes and it gives you a correlation coefficient. And that correlation coefficient gives you a treatment plan. And that treatment plan goes right onto the patient. So now you transfers that plan onto the patient so that we have a, a starting point for our residents, fellows, or those that are out in the community to then know Here's how plans were done at MD Anderson, or here's how planning is done. You can see this is a palladium implant. You've got this pink line. It represents 200% of the prescribed dose. And you can do that because we can minimize the heterogeneity in the center of the implant. And so almost 45% of our, of our prostate is getting uh, um, you know, 200% of the prescribed dose. So we then want to make sure that the you know, every, the, what's, what's the danger of brachytherapy is that we have a single prescription, but you can add a lot more activity and you can have varying degrees of how much dose is actually, or how much activity actually goes in the prostate. So what we've done is we wanted to make sure that we developed a quality assurance nomogram for both palladium and iodine uh, for prostate brachytherapy. And here's the, here's what we looked at. We looked at the activity per volume that we were utilizing for MRI assisted radiosurgery and compared it to the activity that we were using for ultrasound planning. And here you can see 
what those look like. So it gives us that quality assurance framework to make sure and the activity per volume with MRI actually provided a lower amount of activity um, you know, for, these, for our patients. We then take that and we compare it and then we're able, this is now incorporated within the MEM treatment planning system and their next evolution of uh, a version. And what you can do is you can see the difference between what the nomogram and what the uh, Mars uh, plan looks like. And then you can show that difference. And typically, if we get over, you know, anywhere over 7%, we'll then go back and really reevaluate. 5%, I'll also evaluate. Um, if it gets to 10%, we'll really uh, change, the, change the plan somewhat considerably. And what you can do here is you can see we take the total seed strength um, and it, both in millicuries and in air kerma strength and per the uh, prescription dose. And that helps us better quantify, you know, for that particular volume of prostate, are we consistent in our program of giving appropriate amount of activity per volume? Because we talk about the D90s, we talk about all of this, but at the end of the day, if we're not planning with consistent amount of activity per volume, then we can really get people confused in the community. So then it's the MRI ultrasound fusion. This, is, uh, this can be done in MEM. It's more of a static fusion. So it's not a dynamic fusion, meaning that this is still a static image while the ultrasound is visualizing. In my operating room, I am using cognitive fusion because this just takes extra time and doesn't provide a lot of value. Uh, some, we did this in the beginning, but I found that it was, I, I was equally able to do this and cut out another 15 to 20 minutes of my procedure. For MRI post-implant assessment, we've also utilized the same 3D uh, single sequence that takes three to five minutes from a QA standpoint. Um, we did a prospective study. We were able to do this with an outside hospital in collaboration in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, it was an MD Anderson affiliated, affiliated hospital to get their program up with the Mars uh, concept to see if we could extend what was happening in the main center to our community uh, colleagues. And what this demonstrated was we could. We went to them, they, we incorporated that sequence into their uh, system. They were able to use it for, for um, simulation and for post-implant assessment. Um, these are the MRI markers that I was referring. It gives you these positive contract si signal, si uh, signal and um, the seeds are then localized on every side. And what we then wanted to do was verify that we could do the contouring in post-implant assessment in the same way that we could do the contouring on the pre-plan. Um, because the contouring on the post-implant is gonna be a very different potentially prostate because of all the trauma and the implanting of the radioactive seeds that are in it. And sure enough, we were able to demonstrate that we could do active, um, we could do accurate post-implant contouring of the prostate and the external urethral sphincter and provide all that information. Um, and this is all on the axial plane. You can start seeing the strands in here. Uh, in the right bottom corner, you'll see going through the axial image, and then you can see the external urethral sphincter. And that, as I mentioned, becomes a no-fly zone. So during the implants, it's a one centimeter diameter structure on all men. The prostate's vary in size, but the external urethral sphincter doesn't vary. And the nice thing about it is you can identify it clearly, and a lot of the morbidity that we're seeing in brachytherapy seems to be related to the do excessive dose that we prescribe or that by putting seeds into that muscle. The urinary bother, the irritable symptoms that we don't commonly see with external beam because of the lack of heterogeneity that we're incorporating within the external urethral sphincter. Finally, we then went ahead and looked and said, okay, um, what's a way to make dosimetrous life even easier as well? And so we then developed an auto seed localization tool for MRI to help the, uh, the dosimetrist uh, further. And this was a development and clinical optation of what we call the seed net. It's a sliding window convolution neural network for radioactive seed identification uh, for MRI assisted radiosurgery. And through this methodology, we were then able to characterize, and we're now commissioning this in our own clinic right now. And the way this works, uh, and this is nice about MIM, MIM allows you to have these extensions and then incorporate it. But what you'll see is the evolution 
of these uh, identification of the radioactive seeds that occur very quickly. And so what we've tried to do is through every step of the process automate to make consistent high quality process for Mars um, very easy and enabling to the community. And the final product is this. You can get accurate post-implant assessment. You know clearly what you see is what you've delivered. If you haven't delivered a high-quality implant, it becomes very obvious very quickly, and then you learn from it. Uh, many of us have been using day, day 30. I stopped using day 30 a while ago because if I was doing a good quality implant on day zero, I, it was only going to be better because we see about a 40% of edema on those that are not on AD, uh, ADT. Um, for the, so the two things that I talk about our fellow and our residents is number one, have we delivered a high quality implant? Um, if we haven't, what can we do to fix it? Number two, what can we learn from this procedure to do a better job on the next procedure? And that constant positive feedback enables the improvement and ensures that we're having a, uh, a good quality uh, implant program. Um, since we got into the salvaged conversation, I just threw this last piece in here, and this is a patient that had IMRT to 77.3 in 2012 at an outside institution, came to see me. Um, and as we, as we know now, MRI ultrasound fusion guided biopsies help evaluate and identify lesions that we haven't seen in the past. Um, this patient had a PSMA PET and was identified right here. Um, and this is where the location of the lesion is. I showed this yesterday to many that were, um, that were in, the, in the group who came over to the Mars uh, station. Uh, here is the location of the lesion. Um, this was identified and biopsied um, through a template guided mechanism. And sure enough, it was localized right medial posterior and right lateral posterior. So the rest of the gland was negative. It then, we then put these, um, these are these uh, NOVA markers, which allow for MRI identification and ultrasound to localize where the uh, lesion is actually located. Um, these are fiducial markers that um, also permit us to see it under MRI, ultrasound, and CT as necessary. Here was the previous gold marker. You can see the susceptibility artifact um, that existed, and, and there is dose, per, dose perturbation of about 20% that can, 17% uh, that can exist right here. Here was one of the NOVA uh, markers that was used to then delineate the zone of ablation. Um, this was the contour of that site, and as uh, Dr. Crook mentioned, I did give a little bit more wider margin around it. I aim to minimize dose to the uh, urethra um, to avoid any potential risk of uh, urethral necrosis. Um, here was my treatment plan. You can see I aim to focus the uh, total amount of radiation on that right posterior gland. Uh, here was the, um, the implant, and you can see right here, it's consistent with what was planned. And then I did use some hydrogel um, just to push off that dose from the rectum. So MRI surgery can protect the external urethral sphincter. Automation for Mars improves efficiency, standardized contours, and reduces uncertainties. It permits MRI to be used at every step of the quality assurance process, and it avoids implanting the external urethral sphincter. So thank you for your attention. Um, be happy to answer any questions. We move to the discussion section or if there, uh, and as, once we make up the time.